Okay. Does anyone have uh, a a uh, Aaron Rupar style uh, thread for for some of the highlights from the closing statements? Or no? I know that it's ongoing still. I'm saying that, like, is there a... Here. The prosecution's closing argument... The George Cohen. Perry Floyd Jr. And he was born on October 14, 1973. In Fayetteville, North Carolina. I don't know if there's going to be uh, videos in here that, like... They will show videos, probably. No, I, I can't look at all of this. Th these are... They're going to show videos, so I, I can't, like... I can't look at that. You understand? Um... The defense showed videos during their closing arguments, so watch out. Yeah. A lot of footage and autopsy pics. Yeah, the worst part is how desensitized I've come to this. Yeah. Um. <sighs> okay. Okay. Um. King, why didn't you sign up for two ones liftathon thing? I was not. Uh, I was not asked to be a part of it, but I would get owned anyway. I'm so weak right now. Okay. Paramedic tapped him, and finally the defendant got up, what? and they lifted Mr. Floyd onto that gurney, and you saw the way he, he was not, there was nothing there. His head had to be held to prevent it from falling to the ground. He was completely limp. The defendant had to know that. He was there. He was on top of him. And he was on top of him. On top of him. Sometimes you ask for the truth. Sometimes you insist on the truth. And the truth is the defendant was on top of him for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. And he had to know. He had to know. The paramedic tapped him, and finally the defendant got to consider that it is the bystander's fault for distracting the defendant. You're not required to believe this amazing coincidence that after this 9 minute and 29 second prone restraint, that at that point in time, even though he was walking and talking, even though he was breathing, interacting with people, that he chose that moment to die of heart disease? To die of heart disease? Is that common sense or is that nonsense? Or that it was a, a drug overdose? You know that George Floyd struggled with drug addiction and drug use. You know that. You know he had developed a, a t that requires a tolerance. You know what the toxicology report says in terms of the levels, and you know what the testimony was about that. You die of a drug overdose. That's not common sense. That's nonsense. Believe your eyes. What you saw happened, happened. It happened. The defendant pressed down on George Floyd, so his lungs did not have the room to breathe. Um, Schleicher closes his argument. The case is exactly what you thought when you saw it first. When you saw the video, this wasn't policing. This was murder. The defendant is guilty of all three counts. Look, the defense did a pretty good job overall um, because the defense did a pretty good... Uh, the, I mean, not the defense, sorry. The prosecutor did a pretty good job overall when uh, when they when they covered the the issue because it was fairly open and shut. There are... A lot of witnesses, numerous camera angles, everyone saw it, um, and and uh, ultimately, 
it, it's it's just what it is. You saw it. A person died after having a cop kneel aggressively on their neck with uh, multiple people trying to come in and stop that from happening. And he pushed them away and became even more aggressive. And the uh, reason why a lot of people are upset at the prosecution, because they're, I mean, not prosecution, sorry, the defense, Sir. the defense attorneys is because, well, they're scummy as fuck for, uh, obviously they're doing their jobs uh, and their job requires them to be scumbags for the record. It's just, it is what it is. That is, Officer. if you're going to defend a murderous cop, you're going to have to be a scumbag. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> But the other reason why they're upset at the uh, defense attorneys is because their situation is, is ridiculous. Like, it is an open and shut case. So you have to look to, if you are going to defend your fucking, uh, d defend your client, you literally have to say the most insane shit. Appeal to white supremacist uh, rhetoric and, and white supremacist social conditioning. Okay? Uh, by uh, talking about, you know, George Floyd being a criminal or... Talking about how even though it is literally a fucking uh, murder trial for a cop, talk about the victim there as though they deserved it, as they had it coming, which is what they did. Uh, talk about how, you know, there were other underlying circumstances like uh, drugs, potentially, and, and uh, maybe even the exhaust of the car and the carbon dioxide uh, poisoning from the car. Uh, maybe it was the curb's fault. So they engaged in, or they said... The crowd was responsible for agitating the police officer, as though the police officer is just a weapon, a mere weapon, uh, a, a, and not a human being who could be responsible for death. Or they tried to say that he was following the protocol, the police protocol. This is a regular fucking kneel on the neck procedure that should uh, happen no matter what. Uh, that, that, that they were just following regular police protocol. And all of that's bullshit. And I think that the... Uh, all of that's bullshit, and that the defense showed that that was bullshit. The expert witness testimony that we heard also, I think, did a pretty good job of, of destroying that uh, as much as they can. They said that it was the fault of some hyper, some uh, shit thing makes you have superhuman strength and feel no pain. I kid you not. What? And uh, part of the reason why they had nothing is because it was so open and shut. It was sad what happened, but it wasn't murder, and it wasn't racially motivated. It was actually manslaughter. Oh, fuck. That bait. I was trying to read it. I was about to unload onto that before you uh, clapped them. I mean, it's very clearly a uh, very clearly a bait account, but yeah, fuck that. Good, good shit. Good. Yeah. Good clap. Um, you're the actual racist for your seeing race and everything. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, the defense closing statements are psychotic. Of course they reasonable are. Reasonable police officer, the reasonable place, the police officer, reasonable police officer takes into account the safety of the person that they are arresting. They take into account what resources do I have based upon how close am I to a hospital? What's the expected time if I call EMS? Because a police, reasonable police officer at times, they got to put the person in their squad car sometimes and take them because they're farther away. Calling for help, bringing help in would take longer than it would simply to take the person directly. Yes, we've moved on to the fence. This is Eric Nelson, the attorney of Derek Chauvin speaking right now. The reason why I'm not showing the videos is because I'm afraid that they are going to a cut into like the actual video from the scene of the murder or like autopsies and whatnot, like autopsy reports and whatnot that may or may not show like, uh, you know, graphic imagery. And I, and I know that they did, so I don't want to show that and, uh, you know, get banned. And also on top of that, uh, like pretty fucking traumatizing, but we'd be able to see it over and over and over again. Uh, 
uh, in the three-hour closing statement that they put together. And then together. you look at the direct knowledge that a reasonable police officer would have at the precise moment force was used. No, they do it in closing that arguments as well. That includes information that they gather from dispatch, their direct observations of the scene, the subjects, and the current surroundings. They have to take into consideration whether they suspect the suspect was under the influence of a controlled substance. They can take into consideration, because again, this is a dynamic and ever-changing, just like life, things change. It's a dynamic situation, it's fluid. They take into account their experience with the subject at the beginning, the middle, the end. They try to, a reasonable police officer tries to predict or is at least cognizant and concerned about future behavior. Guys, I don't care if, if uh, Mike from PA or Central Committee showed the video, okay? I, I'm not going to do that. I know that I am not at the liberty to do that. Just behavior stop. Based upon past behavior. But the unpredictability of humans factors into the reasonable police officer's analysis, too. Because sometimes people take, reasonable police officers, take someone into custody with no problem, and suddenly they become a problem. It can change in an instant. Okay. Um, talked about many of the. Uh, he their their defense comes around uh, to the conclusion that uh, it was reasonable for him to believe that George Floyd was yeah, just pretending to be dying. Many people talked about. Many people talked about. Many of the officers, of the officers talked about how. I got to turn on the AC real quick. It is not uncommon for suspects to feign or pretend to have a medical emergency to avoid being arrested. Unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, American police brutality is so fucking severe that, uh, you know, people, in order, in an effort to try and unsuccessfully avoid that police brutality, they fake medical conditions. Let's not use this. Let's not use this as an opportunity to analyze policing as a practice and how fucking brutal it is, and instead uh, use that as a justification. How could you fucking get away with saying that is a literal justification? Pretending to pretending to have a medical condition, especially in a situation where, like, the person literally died, okay? Yeah, he must have just been uh, playing dead. As, uh, you know, my, uh, my, my uh, client was uh, murdering him. He, he was thinking, well, he pretended to be dead. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes uh, you, you stab people and they pretend to be dead, so you keep stabbing them. That's how it works. That is the reality. Nobody likes to get arrested, and reasonable police officers know that. How many times does someone, oh, my heart hurts, or I'm having a medical emergency, insert whatever emergency, right? Simply because they... Yeah, you don't fucking... What you're supposed to do as a reasonable officer is take that seriously, by the way, for the record. I don't know where the fuck he's going with this. Even if someone is pretending, who gives a shit? You take him to the fucking hospital, jackass. That's the whole point. The whole point is you don't know if the other person is, is actually... Bro, I swear to God, GTA roleplay cops are better at fucking being uh, police officers than, than real-life cops. It's insane to me. Like, it's insane. It's literally insane. Like, if your motto is protect and serve, you are supposed to protect and serve the community, okay? It's fucking insanity. What are you talking about? You can't take a person to not be lying to you? If you are a police officer responding to a crime or what you think is a crime, and the person that you are apprehending says that they are having experiencing a medical situation, you are supposed to allow the experts or the EMT that's on the scene to immediately come in and, you know, assess the situation. That's what you're supposed to do. That's what normal human beings do. Now, that is if they're actually even faking it. So what, what do you think happens? You think like when a fucking doctor sees you at the hospital, you get a second shot at uh, escaping? Is that what you think? Is that how you think this works? 
You're still handcuffed, motherfucker. You're supposed to just still treat it as a, it's a real situation regardless. Because you don't know. Do you understand? When you handcuff someone, their health, their safety, their freedom is in your hands. Okay? You don't want to go to jail. Motherfuckers think like, uh, I don't know, I guess like, uh, people, people legitimately think that like, you know, if you, what, if you, if you, uh, uh allow the EMT to talk to you, what, they're going to break you out of your handcuffs or something and let you, uh, let you get away. What? You're on the news, buddy. What? Hey. A reasonable police officer will take his training into, ex into experience. And you heard Lieutenant Mercil specifically say that when someone says that they can't breathe, but they are talking, if they're talking, it means they're breathing, right? If they're talking, it means they're breathing. And again. Holy shit, that's really bad, dude. That is, oh, Jesus Christ. It is fucking hard to. Nelson's closing argument features a video of Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck while a bystander tells him. He trained at the police academy, and that's some bullshit. You're stopping his breathing. Hard to fathom how this helps Chauvin's case. Eric Nelson, and there's a video here, so I'm not going to show you, says Derek Chauvin would have been justified in using even more force against George Floyd. Officer Chauvin made a decision not to use higher levels of force when he would have been authorized to do that. Remember, this is... Hey, by the way, guys, this is the... Uh, this is... This is the, uh, the, the same argument that you heard. If you recall, this is the exact same argument that we heard from the other uh, case, uh, the other shooting in Chicago by the Chicago uh, police union leader. That thumb went on fucking uh, face. It was a face nation. He went on CNN on national news and literally said, yeah, we shot. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we shot uh, uh, Adam Toledo. uh in the chest and, and murdered him. He's 13 years old, but you know, we could have, uh, we could have, we could have shot him harder and we didn't. So that was an exercise in restraint actually. Including punches, kicks, elbows, right? All of these tools were available to officer Chauvin. That is not an intent to purposefully use unlawful force. Officer Chauvin People sleep in the prone position. People suntan in the prone position. People They're get massages the basic, in the prone position. I've heard a lot about the prone position. Consider just the basic prone position. People sleep. Yo, I, I think like you got to just prone position this motherfucker. You know what I mean? Like Steven Crowder was too much of a fucking coward to actually, actually recreate the scene. Like just because people, uh, I don't know, suntan in the prone position does not mean that they're suntanning on concrete with three motherfuckers on them with the last one literally putting their knee in its entirety with their one foot off the ground on your neck to choke you out while simultaneously pulling your fucking hands behind your back that are handcuffed further away from your body in an effort to restrict your breathing you know for nine minutes in the prone position, people suntan in the prone position, people get massages in the, the prone position. The prone position in and of itself is not an inherently dangerous act. It is not an inherently dangerous act. A prone position during restraint is not an inherently dangerous act. It is routinely trained and used by the Minneapolis Police Department. This is like saying, uh, your honor, I know I threw the victim off of a bridge, okay, and he died, but people jump. Jumping is not inherently dangerous. So I thought maybe the person wouldn't die. I mean, that person has jumped in his history uh, living uh, on this planet. You, you jump when you play basketball. You jump when you want to, I don't know, uh, scale a, a height that you normally wouldn't be able to reach. So explain this. 
that's Domasan. There is, it is entirely different. Okay, it is entirely different when you're literally choke slamming someone on a fucking concrete to turn around and be like, people sleep on their bellies, motherfucker. Do you not understand? I've heard a lot about this. It's, it's psychotic. Come into play here. And then uh, the judge cuts off Nelson's closing statement after two and a half hours so the jury can get lunch and then it'll resume yeah, after break. That was an hour ago. I, I don't want to interrupt. What do we gain by critiquing the defense? If the defense doesn't properly charge, there will be grounds for a mistrial. What do you mean? What do we gain from critiquing? Uh, what do you want me to do? Uh, it just so you don't want me to cover the story at all? Then this is what I do. I, I... now there was concern here that uh, that Mr. Shawty is Sorry, they're now. now there was concern here that uh, that this is the uh, this is the special assistant attorney general Jerry Blackwell. Okay, uh, who is uh, part of the uh, rebuttal uh, on the prosecution team giving a rebuttal to the defense's closing argument currently. Mr. Chauvin uh, was concerned. And I won't say much more about body language than has already been discussed. And you'll decide for yourself whether that was the face of one who was afraid at the time. Because he had all of the power at this point. He had the bullets, guns, he had the mace that he... Uh, threatened uh, the bystanders with. He had backup. He had the badge. Uh, and uh, he had all of it. And, uh, and, and what was there to be afraid of here, particularly at this scene? There were three high school juniors there and a second grader who was going... The decision is not today. There's rebuttals. The closing arguments are happening today. And then the jury will go in and deliberate. It could take days, depending on if it's... If it's uh, if it's quick, that means that um, I know my screen is not on stream and my face is 100% of the scre uh, screen at the moment. The reason why my face is on screen rather than the video itself is because there is a lot of 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 uh, potential TOS violating uh, vi violating imagery in the arguments that these people are making. So I do not want to show it to you. Also, it is really fucking traumatic. To force people to relive this thing over and over again. <coughs> okay? That's why I'm not showing it. I don't know why every time we do this, we play the same song and dance where people will be like, so it's safe for uh, national television but not Twitch? Yes, I do not make the rules. So yes, some things that are safe for national television are not safe for Twitch. I apologize. It is not. It is completely outside of my control. Take it up with Twitch. Don't take it up with me. Okay. That good. Mr. Chauvin uh, was concerned, and I won't say much more about body language than has already been discussed. And you'll decide for yourself whether that was the face of one who was afraid at the time because he had all of the power at this point. He had the bullets, guns, he had the mace that he uh, threatened uh, the bystanders with, he had backup, he had the badge, uh, and uh, he had all of it. And, uh, and, and what was there to be afraid of here, particularly at this scene? There were three high school juniors there and a second grader who was going to the store to, uh, to get candy. There was a high school senior who was taking her cousin uh, to the store, a first responder on the scene. And there was Donald Williams, um, who wanted nothing more than to try to intervene, to try to save Mr. Floyd's life. Mr. Charles McMillan, a 61-year-old uh, man, uh, that if I gave him a name, I would call him the mayor of the neighborhood. Uh, he just likes to see what's going on and, uh, and to look out for things. but. He was simply there to try to also to intervene, to try to save Mr. Floyd's life. So this wasn't the face of fear or concern or worry. You've seen what the face of fear and worry looked like. 
uh, that day at that time. That's what fear and worry uh, looked like. Shit. When Mr. George Floyd was well aware that with one wrong move of his hand, one turn in the wrong... I mean, it's not TOS. It's just traumatizing. Sorry, it's just... And it could be his last turn that he could be shot to death over an investigation around a fake $20 bill. Uh, no, no. It, it, that's not TOS, chat. That's not TOS. Stop. Don't say banned either. That's fucking annoying. It's not... Now, you might wonder what's wrong with them. That's why they were upset. They didn't deserve to be called unruly because they weren't. And you will hear time and again, oh, the crowd was getting louder. Oh, the crowd was getting more agitated. Earlier in the trial, you hear, oh, they were getting angrier and angrier. And so we, we can't see somehow what it is they're getting upset around. The fact that a defenseless, helpless man is literally losing his life one breath at a time right in front of them and there's nothing that they can do if you love life you get excited when you see life being taken when that's your perception that's what they were excited about and if they all just simply wanted a donut in watching this you might wonder what's wrong with them that's why they were upset they didn't deserve to be called unruly because they weren't. And you will hear time and again, oh, the crowd was getting louder. Oh, the crowd was getting more agitated. Earlier in the trial, you hear, oh, they were getting angrier and angrier. And so we, we can't see somehow what it is they're getting upset around. The fact that a defenseless, helpless man is literally losing his life one breath at a time right in front of them and there's nothing that they can do. If you love life, you get excited when you see life being taken when that's your perception. That's what they were excited about. And if they all just simply wanted a donut in watching this, you might wonder what's wrong with them. That's why they were upset. They didn't. Yeah. He's right. I wish people wouldn't use such passive language. I mean, they're fucking professionals, chat. That's... <sighs> didn't deserve to be called. And the, the, here is, a, here is a, a, a counter to the uh, carbon monoxide defense that they made. This is the defense making this argument, by the way. That was to attack and dismantle the argument that the defense put together. Uh, that this, is the, this is prosecution. Okay. So this is a rebuttal to the closing argument. So I already described to you what the closing arguments from the defense attorney, like Derek Chauvin's side was, like uh, it's the carbon monoxide poisoning, it's the fentanyl in the blood, it's, uh, you know, the, the other people that were excited in the vicinity that also excited the officer and the dynamic changed. You heard all of this stuff, right? So, so now he is uh, countering each individual point. This is what they're supposed to do. They're giving rebuttals of the closing argument. Whose car was it, ladies and gentlemen? that if Mr. Floyd is being subdued on the ground by Mr. Chauvin, and if he puts his face in front of a tailpipe of a car that's spewing out carbon monoxide. Yeah, but this is actually a good point as well. If the crowd didn't react, the defense would then turn around and use that as an argument saying it must not be excessive force. Exactly. Think about it. There were 20 people around and not a single one of them actually reacted. If, if these citizens do not, uh, who are applying common sense, do not think that this is like uh, crazy. Then, uh, then how would an officer think that uh, you know this is uh, going to respond to murder, especially at a time when you know that like you know police brutality is uh, in the forefront of everyone's minds? So it's a, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't in every circumstance. Yeah, forty-five fucking witnesses, dude. It, it, that's why I'm saying it's so open and shut. Oh, the dude literally just made this argument in the video. Why oh. isn't that an unreasonable use of force by an officer? In your custody is in your care. It's not in your oh, custody. Oh, in the previous video, like, yes, people that love life, of course, are getting excited. That's what you're saying. I don't care. Kind of, yeah. In your custody is in your care. What reasonable police officer 
would apprehend someone on the ground, subdue them, and put their face in front of a tailpipe of a car and then think that's a defense. Here, not particularly fair. There's no evidence the car was ever even on. And, and you learned all you need to know, which was if he was suffering from carbon monoxide, as Dr. Tobin told you, you wouldn't be able to get a 98% oxygen saturation from the oxygen they gave him artificially. Isn't this too much trial by media now? The off chance this guy's innocent, he might still get full punishment? Wait, what? What do you mean he's innocent, dude? What the fuck are you talking about? The off chance that it, the guy might be innocent? What are you talking about? What off chance that, that is there that he might be innocent? Explain yourself, chatter. What? You keep hearing drugs in the car, drugs in the car, and the drugs were... Oh, yeah, here. Why are we talking about pills that are not in the system? We know what's in his bloodstream already. We know he struggles with the opioid addiction. Why are we talking about pills that we know were not in George Floyd? Why? You have to decide that for yourselves, ladies and gentlemen. Why is that even being brought up when we know what's in his bloodstream? What is the point? And you keep hearing drugs in the car, drugs in the car. And the drugs were one pill. One. One pill that was not in George Floyd. And then the suggestion that he was somehow taking it in handcuffs in the police car, which makes no sense. Uh, there was no evidence of George Floyd taking any pills in the police car at, at all. There was a pill found there um, only. Why are we talking about? Wow, one entire pill. He's totally innocent. I mean, you, you realize, well, I don't know if you're being sarcastic or not. Oh, 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 you are being, okay, you, you weren't even being sarcastic, you were literally saying, like, one entire pill, okay, good. I, I, I just never know, I just never know when motherfuckers are, like, uh, trying to, uh, you know, say some really idiotic shit, you know what I mean? Um. Wait, let's, there's still uh, closing arguments that are occurring at the moment. State versus McDaniel, and the final argument to the jury of prosecutors governed by a unique set of rules, significantly from the ones governing counsel in civil suits. And even though a close friend of mine lives close to the Corres, they told me that they saw about 20 armored vehicles drive through town. I'm nervous that they know something we don't about the way the verdict is going down. No, they have no idea what the fucking jury is going to say. Are you crazy? No, no one except for the 12 people in that room are going to know what the fucking uh, jury's take is until it is known. It's not, it's, it, those are just regular precautions uh, because, you know, this is an obvious high profile case. Because they realize that if Derek Chauvin, uh, despite, uh, despite all the damning evidence, um, is acquitted of murdering George Floyd in front of the entire world, basically that all hell will break loose. And that's not me, like, threatening that that is going to happen or anything like that. It's me speculating that that will most likely happen. If he gets off free, what? Chauvin is acquitted. There will obviously be rise. Do you think Chuds will do anything if he's convicted? I mean, a lot of the Chuds, like, unless they are mega Chuds, like, straight Nazi motherfuckers, like, even a lot of the conservatives have also damned and criticized uh, Chauvin. Guys, Pat Robertson, who is a literal fucking demon, he criticized Chauvin. Like, he doesn't have a lot of uh, allies here. The only people that are aligned with him are either aligned because they are, like, mega racist, or they're aligned with him because they are supposed to, as his lawyer is supposed to defend him in a court of law. That's what he, he has a right to that, uh, uh, to, to have a, a attorney defend him in a court of law. So I don't even know what will, uh, what will happen here uh, with respect to like conservatives uh, defending Chauvin. I mean, Steven Crowder. Yeah. He's a fucking piece of shit. Like, yeah.
when you when you are able to penetrate the thin blue line, okay, and have your own police chief and have uh, dispatchers and have uh, a number of different uh, uh, people that are cops themselves criticize you and criticize your police practices, it's going to be very difficult to, uh, you know, it's just not going to happen. You're not going to be able to fucking turn around and, and, uh, and, and maintain uh, a, a, a lot of uh, support from even the conservatives. Okay. All it takes is one juror to uh, decide that it's not beyond a reasonable doubt. I, I mean, it's beyond, like, all it takes is for one fucking judge, to, I mean, one, not judge, one juror to assume that it's, a, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it wasn't a manslaughter. Do you understand? Like, that will hold up the entire process and can change that. I fucking hate that. It doesn't matter. It's not, that is our justice system. And, uh, that actually helps. In a lot of circumstances. Hasn't Chauvin also been involved in like three of this while being a cop? It doesn't matter. Um... So listen, if, uh, if this process takes longer, that's not necessarily a good thing because of how overwhelmingly the evidence has been on the side of, of, uh, uh the prosecutors. Wait, hold on. Did the judge overrule the mistrial here? And Part of their closing argument and, and what else in their closing arguments uh, stood out as really powerful to you today? Well, in the closing of the prosecution and in the rebuttal, they worked a central theme, which was in your custody, in your care, and showing compassion. And that came up in a myriad of different ways. First, they set up that Mr. Floyd was not resisting, and they had a beautiful collection of, as he went through the facts, you know, every time he complied with a, mm -hmm. an officer's order, every time he said, Mr. Police Officer, every time he asked, said, please, every time he said, thank you, it was very effective. And then as they got into the as they got into the evidence, it was just beautifully crafted uh, and very well done, short, uh, concise, and effective. And then when they had to come back on the rebuttal, that's when that's when you really we might take not the get we might not get a verdict. We might not get the jury uh, like the deliberations might not end tonight. It, it might go in. It probably will go into tomorrow. I don't know uh, how long it's going to take. I have no idea. I suspect. I suspect uh, it will be short, and I also additionally suspect that it being short is a good thing. Tim on the law that he'd given, and then but came back to that same theme. If it's longer, of it's not a good thing, though. At the ending, it's very, very effective. So, Caroline, let me ask you about the defense. Uh, they told the jury that officers are human beings capable of making mistakes in highly stressful situations. What did you think of that argument? Was that an effective way to go? Well, that's really the theme that the defense has been, you know, portraying from the get-go in this case. And the idea is, r remember, um, the, the prosecution has charged three different crimes here, a, a defense to all of which is that Chauvin acted reasonably under the circumstances. And so that's why you hear this word reasonable over and over again out of the defense mm -hmm. attorney's mouth. The idea is from Chauvin's perspective at the time, not in 2020, as we all know, hindsight is twenty twenty, and I think that that statement there was a, was a little bit of a nod to the fact that, yes, obviously he would have done things differently had he known everything that we know now. But 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 the, the argument that they're putting forth is that he acted reasonably under the circumstances giving, given given um, you know everything that we now know in terms of what he was hearing on the ground, and so that's why they're 
they're, they're expanding the view, they're broadening the view, taking it outside that nine minutes and 29 mm -hmm. seconds. They're saying it started much earlier. Here are the facts. Here's what Chauvin knew. And here's why he acted reasonably. That's the argument. Right, but here's you the problem that with this that. Was they central didn't to deal. the defense's argument. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, here's no, the problem on, Cynthia, with what, how they handled it. I and have to run an ad right now, Chad. I'm sorry. I fucking I really got... fucked up the ads today, but uh, you already know what the deal is. Okay, and I'm then, running an ad. Then the reasonable ad. part was gone, and then they were arguing other things. But they, he never really, in his closing, effectively dealt with the time period when Mr. Floyd was not resisting, was not responsive when he was uh, told that there was no pulse, when the fire person came in and said, I'm happy to give him CPR, he never dealt with that on the reasonable standard. And he spent so much time in wind up, like in some kind of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. I, I was, you know, was way too long. By the time he got to his best argument, which is the drug, the drug argument or, uh, or the causation, everybody was asleep or not listening or doodling in the corner. He, it was a very ineffective uh, close for that reason because it was way too long and did not get to the point in time. So, Caroline, let me get your take on that because so many people have remarked on how long the defense close was today. Your thoughts on on the time they took, and if you were there, would you have done something different? Look, uh, it, it, it's hard to be in Eric Nelson's shoes. is is a difficult position, and mm -hmm. I, I'm not yeah. going to really critique him for that. He, you know, he, he's doing his job and he's he's defending his client. He wanted to hit all the major points. I, will, I I do agree with Cynthia that there's a gaping hole in his argument, which is that he did not. He tried to make the argument that this was like a, akin to a gunshot, like a split second decision that you made in terms of the use of force. It's not that. Again, you know, it's it's the water isn't wet argument that I call, which is he's trying to tell the jurors not to believe what they see with their own eyes on that video, which is clearly like the prosecution is saying, believe what you see. Anybody that sees this video, even a nine-year-old uh, witness, knows that what's going on is not right. I, I will say that you know the defense went a long way in terms of mucking up the, the question about causation. And I do think that he misstated the law, but but I wonder if that's going to help him out in the end because he was quite confusing. You know, there's a huge difference between. Uh, a, a substantial factor in terms of cause of death versus the only factor in a cause of death. And the way that the defense was arguing it made it sound like the prosecution had to show that this was the only causal factor in, in the death, which is not actually the law. And, and, you know, I don't know that that was clarified enough for the jury. And I think that could, that could make a huge difference here. Yeah, you make a great point. The confusion could actually help them. Cynthia, I, I want to ask about something uh, that you tweeted about today. The defense comparing building a criminal case to making chocolate chip cookies. Here's uh, that part of their closing argument. We'll talk on the other side. The criminal case is kind of like baking chocolate chip cookies. You have to have the necessary ingredients. You've got to have flour and sugar and butter and chocolate chips and whatever else goes into those chocolate chip cookies. If you have all of the ingredients, you can make chocolate chip cookies. But if you're missing any one single ingredient, you can't make chocolate chip cookies. It's a simple kind of analogy. But the criminal law works the same way. Cynthia, what you tweeted today his man? metaphor is better off in a misdemeanor case. Uh, let's talk about this and why you didn't like it. Well, here's the thing. When you try cases, you have little things that you do all the time. And it's Bro, I don't understand. Uh, sorry, I don't I don't care about the former federal prosecutor analysis on this. I got to give mine on this. Are they trying to lose? Like, maybe he's just trying to throw, dude. Uh, I think it seems like he was just trying to throw or, or something because it literally trivializes the. Uh, I guess maybe part of it is because he was trying to uh, say, I guess he assumes that like potentially trivializing this makes it uh, makes it easier to. Um... Has the they have the law in black and white and it's good. Yeah, trivializing this potentially makes it easier to fucking, uh, you know, establish doubt. In a uh, in a jury's mind or something. I know what he's trying to say. I know he's trying to say you need to have all the elements in order to establish that there is murder here, like, or 
uh, uh, or, or there's wrongdoing here, uh, then you need to have all the elements, and the elements are not all there. I get, I get what he's saying. The analogy is... I don't know. So, Cynthia, now they are in that jury room. They're going to be deliberating. Obviously, we will not see what happens in that room. But what, what will you be watching for, uh, whether it's, you know, the time that passes, questions they ask? What do you watch for during jury deliberations? Well, it's a very scary time. Uh, I, would, I would just guess, um, I'd be interested in Carolyn's feeling on this, I would just guess that today is all looking at, you know, grabbing food and looking at exhibits probably all day tomorrow to... Um, this took a lot longer than I thought, so I would say probably Thursday at the earliest we get some kind of verdict. By about Thursday night, I would be sitting on my worry shelf chewing my fingernails if I were the prosecutor. And until then, you're always looking for a note, and you're always dying to know who is the, who is, uh, the foreman of the jury or the foreperson of the jury for mm -hmm. a woman, because then you think maybe that'll tell you some tea leaves. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Eric Nelson uh, is now using. This was what was going on in the in the background. Eric Nelson is now using the representative Maxine Waters, saying that pro protesters would get more active and more confrontational if Derek Chauvin isn't convicted as a reason for a mistrial to be declared. He's claiming that she has threatened violence. Um, like what Re Maxine Waters is saying that protesters should get more active and more confrontational if. Derek Chauvin isn't convicted does not mean that it's, uh, you know, go out into the fucking streets and go crazy. Uh, go buck wild. I think that's what they're saying is that, like, the legal system is failing you. You should continue your protest. Here you go. So, um, I mean, but my phone gives me alerts on things that just happened. I mean, you can't avoid it. And it is so per pervasive that it is, I just don't know how this jury, it can really be said to be that they are free from the taint of this. Um, and now it's pretty pathetic. I mean, it's kind of a, it is a hail Mary, you know, like it's not, it's a hail Mary that I feel like shows it's a hail Mary that kind of demonstrates that he is not confident in his own argument. We have U.S. representatives uh, threatening acts of, of, uh, of violence in relation to the specific case. But I guess uh, also at the same time, uh, you know, also at the same time, it's like it's, steady, uh, it's great for an appeal. Like he, he has to say that kind of right. It's, it's mind-boggling to me, Judge. Well, I'll give you that Congresswoman and Waters may have given you something on appeal that may result in this whole trial being overturned. But what's the state's position? Your Honor, the state's position, first and foremost, and this is a concern I raised at the beginning uh, of the proceedings, you know, well into jury selection, is that we can't uh, allow... Uh, statements like this, vague statements, to be considered a part of the record on appeal. If there's a specific statement that a specific U.S. representative made, uh, then there needs to be some sort of formal offer of proof with the exact quotes of the exact statement or some kind of a declaration. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Nelson can do that if he thinks that that's something that's appropriate. Uh, I don't know that... Uh, Anyway, so that was the statement. The trial uh, judge said that Representative Maxine Waters' statements might be a reason for the trial to be overturned on appeal, but the judge then denied the defense's motion to declare a mistrial, breaking news. He said that he would hope elected officials would stop talking about the Jarek Chauvin trial, but he adds one congresswoman's opinion won't make the difference. The defense wanted a mistrial, yes, because obviously they're they're trying to fucking get the client off as best as they can in any way they can. Oh, here it is. Reports. Here, I'm we'll aware watch. that Congresswoman Waters was talking specifically about this trial and about the unacceptability of uh, 
anything less than a murder conviction and talk about being confrontational. But you can submit the press articles about that. This goes back to what I've been saying from the beginning. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case, especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch in our function. I think if they want to give their opinions, they should do so in a respectful and in a manner that is consistent with their oath to the Constitution to respect a co-equal branch of government. Their failure to do so, I think, is abhorrent, but I don't think it has prejudiced us with additional uh, material that would prejudice this jury. They have been told not to watch the news. I trust they are following those instructions and that there is not in any way uh, a prejudice to the defendant beyond the articles that we're talking specifically about the facts of this case. A congresswoman's opinion really doesn't matter a whole lot. Is that a judge trying to restrict the speech of an elected congressman, congresswoman from the bench? Um, if Biden said something similar, do you think the mistrial would occur? Probably. I, I don't know. I, I actually don't know. I mean, it's kind of up to the judge, but... But it's fucking nuts that... Uh, I don't know. I, I really don't know, guys. I'm sorry. I really don't know uh, how that would work. I, uh, well, what I'm saying is like, uh, I don't know if, it, if the responsibility is, is on the jurors themselves, uh, on the jury, like individual, uh, jury members, uh, uh, have to exercise restraint, I think. Jurors in the Chauvin trial were instructed that there is no court transcript available for them to review, so they will have to use their notes, which would seem reasonable, which would seem a reasonable thing to say if it were 1821. Why is that? I don't know is that, is, if that's normal or not, for the record. I, it might be. Especially because uh, the the court transcripts, that's not normal. No, but court transcripts, don't they literally have, like, parts of the record that have been struck off the fucking record? I guess, like, redacted court transcripts would exist, right? Um, kind of sad that you're defending a drug. What the fuck? What? What, dude? What the fuck? Why are people like creating sock accounts to say the exact same thing, brother? You're not gonna turn anyone's opinion here. I, I, I've heard it so many times that it, you're not even triggering me. If that's what you think, you're gonna. Um, if that's what you think you're gonna get out of it, like with your sock account, it's not even happening. Anyway, okay. <sighs> Here, jurors, read the transcripts that are written in shorthand from this multi-week trial. I don't know what it looks like usually. I'm sorry. I, I just don't know. If I knew, I would tell you. Together and get it done, Allison. 
Leanne, the New York Times is reporting that since the testimony began in the Derek Chauvin murder trial on March 29th, at least 64 people have died at the hands of law enforcement nationwide, with black and Latino people representing more than half of the dead. As of Saturday, the average was more than three killings a day. Uh, is that adding to a sense of urgency on Capitol Hill at all? It is that you have that art, that news story that was really shocking um, alongside the potential outcome of the Chauvin trial. And it absolutely was. And that is perhaps going to push people to work even perhaps more quickly. Representative Karen Bass was on CNN over the weekend. Let's listen to what she had to say. The verdict is step one, but what we've seen in too many of these cases, in, in the rare time there is a guilty verdict, we have seen people get off with minimal sentences. And so it is absolutely both. Now, we don't know how long it will take after the verdict that the judge uh, will impose sentencing, so it could be a while. Mm -hmm. But I worry that both are flashpoints. And as you mentioned, during the time of this trial, we have learned of other people who have experienced violence at the hands of the police. So, Allison, people on Capitol Hill, just like people across the country, are bracing for the outcome of this trial. Yeah. And Congress is hoping that they're able to address this larger picture at some point, perhaps relatively soon, regarding policing in this country. Allison. All right, Leanne Caldwell on Capitol Hill. Thank you. The 19-year-old who shot and killed eight people at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. Okay. Um...